Welcome back to the Temple series, part two, the Temple of Solomon. In part one, we discussed the tabernacle of Moses. We looked at how after the fall of Adam and Eve, a great chasm existed between God and man. This great distance was caused because mankind chose to follow their own way instead of being obedient to their God. Because of God's nature of justice and mercy, Adam and Eve were thrown out of the Garden of Eden and could no longer be in his presence. It was his justice that forced them to be apart because of sin, and it was his mercy that protected them from being in his presence. Had they remained in the garden, they would have been destroyed by his holiness because they were now unclean. God moved them away from him and placed cherubim to protect the entrance of the garden. We also discussed in part one how in the time of Moses, God invited Israel up on the mountain and they refused. They chose rather to have Moses act as a mediator between them and God. God met them where they were spiritually and then gave them the Mosaic law. It was a law of rituals and ordinances, all of which pointed to this Messiah that would come to pay the price for their sins. So we see that the Holy One of Israel, the Great I Am, was God, who would come one day to pay the price for our sins by giving His life freely for us on the cross. God spoke with Moses and Israel and taught them that disobedience has consequences He taught them that sanctification is necessary and that in order to come back into the garden, into that beautiful paradise with God, a price would one day have to be paid. God appointed Moses and Aaron to perform these rituals so that Israel would learn about him and prepare for him. Unfortunately, Moses struggled with Israel as they wandered in the desert. At each turn, they were disobedient, ungrateful, selfish, and idolatrous. God showed Moses the kingdom of heaven when he was on the mountain and then instructed him to build the tabernacle. The tabernacle was a place full of imagery that would point them back to God, that would remind them of the Garden of Eden, and that would remind them of the need to be sanctified in order to enter that garden and live in God's presence. The ritual sacrifices, the showbread, the brazen laver of water, The high priest, the holy of holies, and the spotless lamb were all symbols of Jesus. God was trying to get Israel to see who their God was and that he wanted to enter into a loving covenant relationship with them. 2 Nephi 8 says, Behold, my soul delighteth in proving unto my people the truth of the coming of Christ. For for this end hath the law of Moses been given, and all things which have been given of God from the beginning of the world unto man are the typifying of him. Unfortunately, Israel's heart was not soft, nor did it soften after the Lord gave them all the miracles and ordinances and rituals and law. They didn't see the symbolism and the lessons the Lord was trying to teach them through the law. So they wandered in the desert for 40 years, constantly disobeying God's commands. Each time they broke his law, he added new laws. Over the course of 40 years, the simple Ten Commandments grew to 613 laws that they must live by or suffer the consequences. Their society became one focused on rituals, ordinance, and justice. They began to focus completely on how to keep the law instead of getting to know the lawgiver. So God sent prophets to call them to repentance, to remind them of their God and to invite them back into his presence. But Israel continued their road to destruction and idolatry was allowed to enter back into their worship. They jockeyed for position to gain power over their enemies and each other like a herd of sheep with no shepherd. They tried to emulate the other religions and cultures around them by changing the ordinances and demanding that God allow them to have a kingdom. God didn't want Israel to have kings. God's intent was to set up the kingdom of God on earth. He wanted to fill the earth with his presence, not just dwell within their tiny tabernacle. He had given them a government ruled by judges and law 
but it wasn't enough. And so God allowed them to have kings, but gave them a warning about their disobedience and what would happen to that kingdom if they strayed from his law. The first king was Saul, and at first things were going well, but then because of disobedience, Saul lost his position, and it was given not to his son, Jonathan, but to the youngest son of a family of poor shepherds. God was trying to show Israel that his kingdom was one of love and humility, not prestige and honor of men. He was trying to show them that he values humility and sacrifice, not wealth and power. But Israel would not listen. So in 1003 BC, David became the king of Israel at the age of 30 years old. Despite Israel's disobedience, God blessed David and the kingdom. David was a man after God's own heart and had a genuine desire to know him and to please him. And they began to prosper greatly. David conquered many of Israel's enemies and captured Jerusalem. Jerusalem was the ancient land of their forefathers where Abraham had made his covenant with God on Mount Moriah. How fitting it was to make this same land the capital of their great nation. David established Jerusalem as his capital, and now they were back on the land of their inheritance. The tabernacle of Moses was in Gibeon at that time. In 999 BC, or thereabouts, David separated the Ark of the Covenant from the original tabernacle that was in Gibeon and brought it up to Jerusalem and placed it within a new tabernacle that he built. It was on this journey that the famous events of Uzzah being killed for reaching up to steady the ark as it wobbled on a wooden cart they had made to transport it, took place. God had commanded that they use the poles and that it was to be carried exclusively by the Levites. Once again, God was demonstrating that disobedience leads to death. The original tabernacle of Moses remained in Gibeon while the ark was now in its new uh, tabernacle of David in the city of David. Once the ark was in the new tabernacle that David built, David burnt offerings before God to worship him. All of Israel were allowed to worship, and the ark was no longer hidden within the limits of the Holy of Holies in the temple. Men, women, the disabled, everyone could worship there. This tabernacle was symbolic of the tabernacle of Jesus, who would die for all people, and the only requirement was a repentant heart and a desire to be one with him. Because of great success and prosperity in a short time, David decided that he wanted to give God a better place to live than the tabernacle that he had made. He was sitting in his palace of cedar and gold and lamenting that God was living in a tent while he was in a palace. 2 Samuel 7 says, And it came to pass, when the king sat in his house, and the Lord had given him rest round about from all his enemies, that the king said unto Nathan the prophet, See now, I dwell in a house of cedar, but the ark of God dwelleth within curtains. And Nathan said to the king, Go, and do all that do all that is in thine heart, for the Lord is with thee. So this was Nathan, the prophet of God, telling him, Go ahead and build a house. If that's in your heart to serve the Lord, then go ahead and do it. But then look what happened in verse 4. And it came to pass that night that the word of the Lord came unto Nathan, saying, Go and tell my servant David, Thus saith the Lord, Or shalt thou build me an house for me to dwell in? Whereas I have not dwelt in any house since the time I brought up the children of Israel out of Egypt, even to this day, but have walked in a tent and in a tabernacle. David asked the prophet Nathan to go to God and petition that he be allowed to build a temple for him. Nathan was told in a dream that at no time had God asked to live in anything but a tent. David was told that God would plant his people and allow a temple to be built, but that David's descendant would build his house. David was obedient to God's command and did not build the temple, but began gathering supplies and making plans for the temple that his son would build. He admonished his son Solomon to finish what he had started once he he became king. There's a strong type and shadow in these verses in 2 Samuel. God told David that his descendant would build the temple and his kingdom would last forever, 
Jesus was a direct descendant of King David, and he was the everlasting temple on earth whose kingdom would never fail. So time passed, and David died. Solomon became the king and immediately began the construction of the temple that his father had prepared. He modeled it after the shape of the tabernacle of Moses, which was still in Gibeon, except everything was built to a much grander scale. The only artifact used from the original tabernacle of Moses was the ark itself. Everything else was remade. All of the original artifacts from the time of Moses were stored in special areas around the exterior for the preservation of relics. Solomon also put new items within the temple that were not in the tabernacle of Moses. For example, the tabernacle of Moses had two cherubim that were sewn into the veil of the Holy of Holies and two on the ark facing one another. These two sets of cherubim remained as in the tabernacle, but then he also built two statues of cherubim placed on each side of the ark. These statues were massive. They were 15 feet tall by 15 feet wide. They would, uh, they would not have even fit in the original Holy of Holies in the tabernacle. Solomon also created a massive altar for the burning of sacrifices. The portable altar of Moses was 8 feet by 8 feet. Solomon built the permanent altar 30 feet by 30 feet. Pretty much everything in the temple was scaled up, at least by double and maybe and more than that in some cases. The construction process of the Temple of Solomon took seven years and a volunteer workforce of over 30,000 Israelite workers and 150,000 Canaanite workers. They also employed Phoenician artisans and uh, craftsmen from Tyre. The estimated cost of building Solomon's Temple today, because of all the gold and, the, and all the fine materials and all the labor, is around $6 billion. Solomon also wanted a holy place to be silent while they worked, and so he didn't want a lot of construction noise going on, and so he had all work done off-site, and the materials were brought on after the stones had been cut and, and everything was ready to put together. That way it minimized the noise and the dust and the commotion on this holy site. Also, if something didn't fit, they would have to take it off-site to fix it and then bring it back on to assemble. So once they were finished with the construction... The Ark of the Covenant was moved into position by the priests. God's power, that was the last step, and God's power then filled the temple, and all of Israel saw the fire come down from heaven, just like the fire that came down and rested on the tabernacle of Moses. Second Chronicles 7 tells us, verse 1, Now when Solomon had made an end of praying, the fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifices, and the glory of the Lord filled the house. And the priests could not enter into the house of the Lord, because the glory of the Lord had filled the Lord's house. And when all the children of Israel saw how the fire came down and the glory of the Lord upon the house, they bowed themselves with their faces to the ground upon the pavement and worshipped and praised the Lord, saying, For He is good, for His mercy endureth forever. The Lord blessed Israel because of His great love for them and the sacrifices they had made to create a holy place for him to commune with them. Solomon then praised the Lord as well before the congregation, and for eight days the people worshipped and sung praises to God. Once they had finished the dedication ceremony, Solomon sent everyone home, and the Lord appeared to Solomon in the temple to warn him that he and Israel must be holy in order for God to bless the nation. Unfortunately, years later, Solomon ended up living in idolatry and polygamy. After Solomon's idolatry and disobedience, the Lord kept his promises and withdrew his blessings upon Israel. Israel was divided into two kingdoms, Judah and Israel, immediately following the death of Solomon. Subsequent kings also struggled to be faithful to God and Israel suffered a period of idolatry, death, and captivity. The Temple of Solomon was destroyed by Babylon, as prophesied by Lehi in 587 BC. The Lord's blessings had been removed because Israel's heart was set on riches and the respect of men. The Ark of the Covenant disappeared during this time, and all subsequent temples did not have the Ark of the Covenant in their Holy of Holies. <music>
In part three, we're going to discuss other temples that were built before Christ came and the prophecies of the new covenant with Israel. We will find out what happens when you build a temple for yourself and leave God out of the process. We will also see what God was planning to do in giving us the perfect temple, a place where heaven and earth are combined into one. Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, and Messiah, and friend. Until next time, take care.